Transmitting to you from Old Heart Radio. It's episode two of Amateur's Note. One take is all it needed this time. We didn't talk about the intro before we did it. Which is the sweet, that's the sweet sauce. There was a lost episode. That we don't need to talk about that. We tried to intro the show for so long that we got too tired to actually record an episode. There were lots of factors why it didn't work. Yeah. One, I was trying to be too scripted. We were, we, it was, it would be a great idea for like a, uh, you know, like the video document or the video essays. Well, I think it's a, I, I don't know how to podcast. That's what we've learned. Um, no, no, but it, also Arlo, our cat was being a real pain. Yeah. He was like running around anyway. I think we'll, um, it was a, it was an episode focused on flea bag, which we will definitely touch on at some point because I think what we had, what the ideas we had were really good. But we just need to refine them a bit. That said, that's not what we're talking about today. No. What are we talking about today? Uh, we are geeking out about narratives, whether it's like movies or TV. Mostly movies, I guess, in this case. Mm-hmm. We might touch on books later. That throw the audience sort of in the deep end. You don't get much exposition. You're just sort of expected to keep up. Okay, I thought that there would be a word... Yeah. This. So I looked it up. Like, what's a word for a story where it doesn't give you much explanation? Like, you. Our examples today are going to be Mad Max. Yeah, which we rewatched for the purposes of recording this. Um, The Batman. Yes, yeah, so another good example. And we're going to talk about Moon Knight because it's relevant. And I think Moon Knight's a really good example. Yeah. I think. And all those sort of work for different reasons as well. Which but anyway, I, I looked up if there was like a technical term. And there's not? I don't think so. I think it's just lack of exposition. Well, I guess that's fair. But I think it's it's something that like when you think about it, like you can sort of place it in your but mind. But I feel like it should have a word. Yeah. Let's coin doesn't. one. Okay. Don't Non-sposition. Put me, don't put me on the spot. <laughs> don't put me on the spot. We're fresh from Wordle. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, no, I think I, well, well, it's most fresh in our minds, Mad Max, yes. which sort of, it's, I think my favorite movie right now. I, I think it of, of like, it's in my top five, not to like say a particular one is better than the other, mm-hmm. but I really love that movie. And one of my favorite things is that it just throws you in and expects, it's like, Hey, here, get your footing and now like fucking keep up. And just figure it out as we go along. Honestly, there was more intro than I thought that there was, than I remember there being. Because we watched it, you know, years ago when it first came out. And when we rewatched it last night, you get a little intro bit of like, all the water is gone. And like little news clip, you know, audio. Yeah, it's like about the world all going to shit. And then you get dropped into the post-apocalyptic world essentially but i mean it gives you what you need to know it's like max says i used to be a cop yeah uh, and now i lost everyone i love and i think his like main line is that i'm reduced to one instinct survive and then that's like that's all you need for the whole movie but then you're given like these other chunks of information that you just sort of have to extrapolate through like Mm -hmm. using the little bits that you've picked up on you have to sort of start figuring stuff out like the half-lifes well, yeah, the main part of the story that I think is most confusing or like something that you would expect a lot of exposition from yeah. is what is the bad guy's name? The Immortant name? Joe. That's a, such a... Do they ever even call him that? Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> you don't need to know his name, but he's the big guy who's controlling all the water yeah. and... The Aquacola. He's basically like a... Yeah, this is I did not pick up on that the first time we watched it, that they called the water aquacola anyway. Um, 
He's like a warlord. Yeah. Uh, then, controlling like, everybody. They throw all these things out. It's like, it's rapid fire though. Like he's obviously very sick. Mm -hmm. All of his, he can't, he can't have a healthy error. Mm -hmm. And all of his kids have some kind of, have some kind of developmental disorder. And, but none of this is given to you. And I think that there's sort of a beauty to that. And you can keep going through the movie. Well, I don't know. It's a weird balance because yeah. I feel like there are probably people who've seen Mad Max who couldn't get on board because of the lack of explanation yeah and i think that is actually a criticism i've seen oh really yeah and um i definitely think like me being a being a fucking nerd like there's level there's like layers to this where well, yeah because if you know about the games then you have more backstory than yeah just the so and that's worth clarifying the mad max game didn't sell well it came out the same day as metal gear solid 5 but there are previous movies. Yeah, there are stuff. previous movies, but the movies don't really connect. The game is the only real connective tissue. Okay. It's it's the Mad Max series has always been like an anthology series where Max is never the main character. Mm -hmm. And so in the game, you're given like the 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 kid that's mostly speaking to Max through hallucinations is turns out to be like a surrogate daughter that gets murdered by a different son of a Morton Joe. Mm -hmm. And it's a fuck it's the game came out like six months after the movie and i remember the dread and the sadness that came from knowing where this was going and it it was it was super sad playing through it but before then it like there are little things even from like the old movies that like i said don't really connect as an example the guy who plays the morton joe mm -hmm. was the main villain in the first mad max movie he's it's the same actor Oh. Yeah, so the Mel Gibson iteration of Mad Max yeah, killed Mad Max him at the end of the first people. movie. So obviously fans are like, it's the same guy. That's why they think he's immortal. He survived that horrific crash. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well. It, yeah, exactly. Stuff that just is completely not given to you as an audience member. But yeah, I, that's so, that's really interesting because I think it's, it's cool that if you really liked the movie, you yeah. could then dive deeper into these layers. Yeah. But anyway, the point is that the movie can stand alone yeah. by itself as a lot of sci-fi. Sci-fi fantasy. It's difficult to... It, exposition is a really difficult thing. And yeah. I know this from my writing background is like you, the balance of how much do you explain, how much do you word vomit and world build yeah. without losing the audience. Yeah. Because you can't explain the whole magic structure of your, you know, explained world with all these pronouns that nobody, oh my gosh, I saw this TikTok of this guy who was like reading Dune for the first time. And it's just like, the prince of Zephyr was in his pod and he had a scarab <laughs> dagger. And it's like none of these things make any sense yeah. because there is so much exposition that's needed. You know, I got to I got to give him one thing. And this is this might be why Mad Max just want to get away with it. It's a very simple post-apocalyptic narrative, at least at base level. Yes. We ran out of gasoline um, and um, and natural resources wars ended up destroying the world. Mm -hmm. And there were some people that survived because Australia was the most neutral and the smallest target. So that's why it's in Australia. Okay, you don't even need that. You don't even, you don't even need they don't, that. They don't say it's in but then, Australia. But then, what I, but then what I will commend them for, and this ties into what you were saying, that there's, especially in fantasy and sci-fi, there's such a need to explain. And it's sort of, it's like a trope at this point mm. that you'll have some big dump of, of like, ex, uh, like expository information. The writer or the writers and the storyboarders for Mad Max, for every character that had more than five seconds of screen time, they wrote a one page origin story for each character. And they never did anything with it. They just wanted to make sure the world felt fleshed out and like they could give credence to every decision they made that's a fucking crazy thing to do and then just like leave it but 
I mean, what they tell you, I literally heard this in school about writing, is you don't want to do what Star Wars does. Yes. Where they have yeah, yeah. A, the exposition scrawl Which, at the beginning of the movie. That's actually very interesting because I've heard that too. Uh-huh. And I've heard that like Star Wars is the only franchise yes. that's ever going to get away with yes. it. Yes. <laughs> that's at least at least the visual word. I don't, well, obviously it worked for them. Yeah. But it, it's it, does that feed into in, in your mind does that feed into the whole like you got to break rules or <sighs> uh, that was I felt like that was an answer in of itself. I don't know because there's no there's no right or wrong answer. When it works, it works. Yeah. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I don't know. Some of the series that I loved have been ruined by over explanation. And that's not that's not talking about like Like what? Do you have a particular example? Okay, well, I this book series doesn't hold up anymore. I loved it when I was a kid, but the Divergent series. Okay. It's a trilogy and it's it's a sci-fi world. I a lot love- of lot of listeners will have heard of it. Okay. I It's no, no, no. I mean like it, there were those movie adaptations that were coming out. And, yeah, I don't stand by the movies at all. Yeah. Uh the third they the, the part 1 to book 3 was so bad they canceled part 2. Yeah, it's it's horrible. Um but I really loved those books. I read them several times. Really? But no, I remember my sister loved them, so. But I read one and two several times. The third book was terrible. Really? Because basically the premise is they're in this Was the second one the best? Yes. Every time. Every fucking time. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> with the with YA novels from our childhood. So it takes place in uh, Chicago, far in the future. Yeah. And the whole city, it's just one one city, Chicago. And it's been divided into a bunch of factions. And when you're 16, you have to like choose which faction or whatever. Yeah. And they all have some attribute that they are known for. So uh, Dauntless is the brave people. They're yeah, yeah. in charge of like security of the city. And they're like the army. And the main character, um, she is divergent, which means that she is could fit into basically any of the factions that she wanted to, which is something you don't want to be. You yeah. want to just fit in one. Anyway, they try in the third book to explain like why the city is like this. And it turns out that there's... They're like an experiment or something. That's what I thought. I think you told me this before, and it was just like I it, don't even remember. The explanation didn't really make a lot of it sense. It was like a, it was like a test. It was yeah, like, and so they were trying to make divergent people. I yeah, don't that know. Seems like a cop out. That seems like lost. But and that only comes into the story in the third book. So yeah, it feels bizarre. like an afterthought. Yeah. It felt like something that the author was like, well. Obviously, that, that, that I need feels to like explain. a cliffhanger you leave off before a sequel. No, hey, really? I don't. I don't. Okay. No, it's we got years. We got to destroy the the testers or whatever. It's been years, but I. It ruined the book. Like <laughs> you didn't. I don't think that the the story wasn't really about that. Yeah. So it didn't make it was sense. It's extraneous. To me. Yeah. That's fair. I mean. That and the thing that comes to my mind is the rise of Skywalker. Mm-hmm. When we're talking like that, and me and Jared have talked so much about the se- the sequel trilogy of Star Wars being a fucking mess, mm-hmm. and it's like it was that need to correct and the need to explain, coming from exclusively fan feedback and fan backlash. And I'm so like, I know people have such mixed feelings on the Last Jedi. It would have been better if they just stuck to their guns. Ray didn't need to be a Palpatine. Yeah. Snoke could have died and everyone could have just left it, mm-hmm. left it there. It would have been perfectly fine for there just to be a movie that no one liked in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's worse for it. I think that the need to explain, the need to correct made it worse. But I think, I don't know, back to, I mean, back to like Mad Max and then sort of going into the another good example would be... I think that there's like the courtesy that Mad Max also has is that no one knows about it. 
or knew about it. Barely anyone remembered Mad Max. It was mm-hmm. fucking crazy. It's been like 35 years since George Miller did one of them. I mean, the guy directed Happy Feet in between. <laughs> and it's, which is, which is a crazy thing in and of itself. But like, I think it gets, you can push a bit of that lack of exposition, exposition off because it is a easy to understand setup in the first place. There's some weird shit, but you, you can get on board pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to have all this baseline knowledge to get into it. What I do think, and this is something that I that sort of feeds into example two, is when you have something at this point like Star Wars, or something so ubiquitous that almost everyone can be expected to understand, like the setup, or not need all the pieces in this film, or this piece of work, to completely get set up. It's like the Batman, you know? You didn't need everything from that. You didn't, didn't need the whole Bruce Wayne. You didn't need to see the parents get shot in that one, you know? Yeah, I think Batman, it's very different in terms of exposition than Mad Max because Batman is much more in the cultural... I guess. Yeah, so everybody knows, okay, Bruce Wayne was Sad an orphan boy. and he, you know, his parents died and he's rich and, you know. Yeah. And so I appreciate that in this film, they didn't feel they needed to beat the same horse. And they were just like, okay, this version of Batman has, he's already operating. We don't need to see him yeah. make build the suit, yeah. you know. He doesn't need to get trained. We don't need to see the origin. We can skip ahead yeah. to when he's operating. He's already, I don't know. Yeah. I think, what was it? It's like year two, I think they've said. Which is, I, I think, he's a good young. place to to start. Yeah. I think um, there's so much. Yeah. I mean, every single fucking director has had to put the staple on the Wayne's getting murdered at this point. They and also did that with Spider-Man, right? Like, they didn't... That's actually a good one. We didn't think of that. Yeah, No Way Home. Because they didn't show Peter, like, getting his powers and becoming Spider-Man. Which he actually... is sort of Spider-Man already. Yeah. Yeah, I guess Civil War comes around. He's already been with Spider-Man for a minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's actually a really good example. Yeah. There's some stuff in, like, they're so, like, constant in culture that you just don't need to see it again. Mm-hmm. And, like, I think... There's a point where you see it so many times it loses its impact. Mm-hmm. That said, I actually find Spider-Man interesting. They're doing an animated series about the fr- him getting his powers. Like a prequel to Homecoming and Civil War. Interesting. Yeah, it's going to be on Disney+. Plus. It's called Spider-Man Freshman Year. So, I don't know what the deal is there. <laughs> well. Because every single... Homecoming was sophomore. No Way Ho- Or Far From Home was junior. No Way Home was his senior year. And there's that one year sticking out. I don't know how I feel about prequels. I don't. I, this is a whole episode of, in of itself. Which I was going to say, there's that Furiosa sequel coming out. Or prequel coming out with Anya Taylor-Joy. I don't think I like prequels. I don't think so. I don't think I like prequels. Unless it's so deep in the past that it doesn't have any like impact. That's why Hogwarts Legacy is a prequel sort of, but it's so far removed, yeah. so deep in the past that it does it won't affect Harry Potter. That the threads will be like very thinly connected. Uh, subject for another time. Anyway, <laughs> subject, that's actually a great episode idea. I don't think I like prequels. Anyway, um our other example was going to be Moon Knight. Yes. I think this falls more into the Mad Max category, but there's even less exposition. Which I... Okay, this is where everything just fits together perfectly. I think the lack of exposition for Moon Knight is such a good narrative tool it's a great narrative for the tool. character because Moon Knight obviously has his personality issue. I really hope they're not going to say that it's DID. Yeah. That's another subject. But I hope they just say his mind is fractured because of he's being inhabited by a a god yeah um but we have steven who also has mark in the same body and apparently there's like john (laughs) there may be more we don't know yet but steven flashes in and out of the body yeah and we 
as the audience only see that like split second. We're right along with Steven yeah. and his point of view. We don't know what happens when yeah. Mark takes over. I think, and there's this clever buildup as well, where it's just like he's living a like a mundane sort of sad life, but then in his home, there's like all this weird shit, and then you see him like don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep. He's t- he's on the he's on the phone, and he finally dozes off for a split second, and then he's smash cut. He's on the ground with a broken jaw. <laughs> like it was fucking crazy. It was great. Kate loved Moon Knight so much, or that first episode mm-hmm. so much. That you text me the next day saying, I'm embarrassed how much I liked Moon Knight. I I thought the first episode was... I think it's the best first written... First... Well, okay. I think it was one of the best isolated episodes that Marvel has made. I think it was even better than Loki and WandaVision. Just that one episode. Yeah. Now, when we got to the second episode, I didn't think the second episode was as strong. Yeah. But it was good. The first episode was so tight. Yeah. I think, and this actually brings up another thing. Sort of within the theme, if you're going to leave so much up in the air, the answers have to be satisfying. And I think... But I hope that it leads to more mysteries. Yeah. You know, like, as... What what was so intriguing about the first episode of Moon Knight is that we are trying to solve the mystery too. Yeah. And as Steven slash Mark yeah. starts to unravel like everything that's been going on. Well, as Steven is the one who's been really left out. Yeah. So we're more in the point of view of Steven. Yeah. And, well, now maybe in Mark's head. But... As he starts to unravel what's going on with Mark and his past, I hope that there are still more questions because it sucks when you learn everything and then there's like nothing else. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I think, and I think that that sort of, once again, this is where, this is the, this is the balance that stuff can hit. Like I, I like comics quite a bit. I can never, I will be lying to you if I say I've read a Moon Knight comic Mm -hmm. (laughs) in any regard. I know about the character. I get the gist. And I think that, like, you have, you can, there's so many mysteries left, let's say, because you have that flexibility. Like, it's a character that's yet to be adapted. They're already making changes from the comic counterpart, Mm -hmm. like significant changes. But that's not a bad thing. And it's creating more mysteries. Even the villain's a complete mystery. He appeared in one comic in the 80s and then never showed up again. So it's like you have a level of uh, of flexibility there. You can sort of push the narrative in whatever directions you want to pull. And like comparing that to the Batman, where that is almost that being so direct and so like just into the narrative is almost a tool to get around how much people know that character at this point, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I mean, like, like, we hadn't seen an iteration like the Bruce Wayne and Batman from the Batman yet. Like, Matt Reeves did a really good job making a relatively unique version of the character. But to me, it almost rings as, like, we don't need to show people this. They know they're not here for this anymore. Mm-hmm. Let's give them something actually engaging. And it brings me to something I wanted to talk about in the Batman in the same way that you're following Steven piecing everything together, you're very much there with Bruce Bruce Wayne as he's piecing together the Riddler's plot. Mm-hmm. And I find it incredibly effective. Well, I've heard you say this before, but you come to Batman for the villains. Yeah. So, I think the most interesting... Well, okay, but I really liked the Batman. So, I, <laughs> I really liked this iteration of Batman, at least. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that keeps you engaged is learning about the villain. Yeah. And, you know, this was a completely different direction for the Riddler. Yeah. And it worked. We'd seen only, the only on-screen adaptation was Jim Carrey in the 90s, Mm. which was like a a cartoonish version of the Riddler. And going to essentially the, like, a serial killer was pretty fucking, it 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 was a bit of a trip. But how they ended up making him 
sort of reflect the ideology of Batman almost as like sort of a bastardized version of what Bruce Wayne was going for Mm -hmm. was this was a very interesting twist and I didn't see it coming yeah and then you get I don't know I thought the Batman was a little bit too long (laughs) yeah but so maybe they could have benefited from a little bit less in terms of exposition and everything else but the way that you sort of this was a great first movie because yeah. you're learning about Gotham as a whole and like the setting of this story. Yeah. Along with these characters. I don't know. It was just good. Well, I think, <laughs> I love I think, that. Well, I think there's there's something to be said like about like the setting as character. Mm-hmm. I mentioned this briefly on a uh, Matinee edition that we were the Matinee edition we recorded the other day mm-hmm. because we talked about the sequel to the Batman. And we talked about Gotham Knights and how important it is for Gotham itself to be a character in those narratives. Mm -hmm. I definitely think the Wasteland is a character in Mad Max to a point. Interesting. And I think that like good aspects of setting can bring, it can really aid that like uh, the ride that the audience is on making something like weirdly familiar, like in Gotham, there's chunks of reality in that, but it's twisted in such a way that it stays engaging, but you never really get lost in it. Mm-hmm. I, I, if that it, does that does that make sense? Does does that does that does that hold true in your mind? I don't know. Setting as character is really interesting. How so? <laughs> Dead air. Well, setting is extremely important for many reasons, and. But setting is mostly there just to give a mirror to characters. Interesting. I haven't thought of it like that. Well, because all of what... This is why we do this show, folks. Because if you're building a, a story from complete scratch, you can manipulate the setting in any way you want to show something about the character. Yeah. So, for example... In Moon Knight, he's constantly surrounded by mirrors. Yeah, oh, that's a good example. Literally a mirror. Literally a mirror. <laughs> there's, there's a whole layer of mirrors going on there. And I think, yeah, yeah you're right, you're right. And actually, in, in looking at breakdowns, they do some pretty fun stuff with all the mirrors. Well, setting is like a whole, I mean, that's a whole aspect of story. You can't have a story without setting. Well, so, yeah. But anyway. Do you do? I, I want to. I want to say, was Divergent the book series that you were talking about? What do you mean? You said you had a, a, a different like series or something that sort of fed into this theme that you wanted to hold on to to bring up. Also, you had you said you had a surprise about Moon Knight. No, 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 no not about Moon Knight. What was it? It's a separate surprise. Okay. <laughs> it's, it doesn't have anything to do with the conversation that we're having. Really? Shit. Okay. Okay, well. but it's about movies. Well then, go for it. Right now, you yeah. Why not? Do the surprise now. You said you wanted to do it on on the podcast. I thought you wanted to talk a little bit longer. Okay. I don't know. We're just going with the flow. This might spark a conversation of sorts. I present to you what Percy Jackson. Oh, I saw this. Oh no, you saw it. Already? I saw the kid. Oh my god. Oh god, I'm so excited. <laughs> Maybe I think that's. I actually think we're still ironing out the format here. We went on for about 30 minutes on that first subject. We could have talked about it longer. We could have talked about it longer. But I think that we'd be falling into like some other categories of interest and stuff we could talk about. Okay. I just think, all, all in all, I think when like you're given like specifically less information, it can make going through a mystery or like going on the ride that is a movie or like a book like all the more fun. Because you're, it's putting faith in the viewer. It's putting faith in the audience member that you're capable of keeping up Mm -hmm. i think that there i think that in a lot of cases uh audiences are treated like fucking morons and i think it's why there's the like ridiculous exposition dumps have turned into jokes at this point Mm -hmm. i mean you 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 get that right yeah books are probably guilty of that in in a way well that's why it's almost hard for me to read really like high fantasy high sci-fi where it requires a ton of exposition yeah because it just gets 
boring and it is hard to follow when they just dump things on you and then yeah. move on um so i tend to lean more less like i don't know there's a lower lower fantasy well, but no I lower think that, I think sci-fi that, i think that's valid though because it's like there's it's literally a gate it's literally a gatekeeping thing. like i could not i couldn't read game of thrones yeah because i thought it was way too i've i've heard that about game of thrones heavy. i've heard that about the witcher books i yeah that's fucking, why i haven't touched shit. i haven't touched the witcher because i know i know that it would be a problem yeah for me. you know i mean because i'm a genius podcast host i remember as a kid being able to immediately understand percy jackson well that's why percy jackson i'm um, so excited what are other <laughs> examples oh uh, i think hunger games did it well hunger games because they're all rooted more in reality so it's easier yeah. for fantasy elements to be included but anyway, yeah, I wanted to show you Percy Jackson because I saw I s- the they cast him and he's actually a child. Hallelujah. Is this so okay, we can be out of the subject and just sort of into stuff that we can geek out a bit. Like thank God, right? Thank God. <laughs> I think after after the Avatar cast came out mm-hmm. and it was a bunch of kids, it gave me hope. Yes. It gave me hope that like Percy Jackson, they might not get some fucking like teenagers. I don't want, I, Alexand, Alexandria Daddario is a great actress, mm-hmm. but she was 23 when she was playing Anna or Annabeth mm-hmm. in the second movie. Mm-hmm. She'd already been fully naked on True Detective. Oh God. <laughs> and, and I love Logan Lerman. I He is not a bad actor. I love Logan Lerman, <laughs> but he, yeah, he was too old. It was, it was, and then you start breaking the reality for people. It's like, yes, it is a bunch of kids interacting with Greek gods, but it's believable because they do stupid shit that 12 year olds do. I don't know. The whole movie was just wrong. I don't think I saw it once. So I saw it. I really fucking loved it. You did. I like in, in retrospect, I, it makes no sense. Why? And like I think I watched it the last time I watched it I might have been like I might have been like fifteen and I was like wow I remember really liking this it was before the Sea of Monsters came out because it was I didn't like, even watch the Sea of so Monsters so my mom where they made Annabeth blonde because people were so mad that she had brown hair in the first one <laughs> yeah okay I think I rewatched the first one because I was bringing Victoria my sister and one of her friends to go watch the Sea of Monsters while my mom was in the theater next door to it watching the butler <laughs> yeah and she was like you know the kids can watch this while we're watching this heavy drama mm-hmm. and i remember i watched percy jackson and the olympians and i was like oh holy shit this is terrible like I, it clicked for me that that was a bad movie and oh. then i went and watched the sea of monsters oh my god he kills chronos at the end what yeah oh, they knew they were done <laughs> No, no, but then the but then uh, Zeus's daughter shows up in the fucking in the fucking tree at the end. So they were sequel baiting. What? Yeah, it was bizarre. It was bizarre. It was crazy. And then they axed the rest of that series. That's People it. want Logan Lerman to show up though. I, it'd be funny in the show. Who was the guy that played? Um, oh, he was one of the one one of the fucking Bonds played the uh, the centaur. Like the Professor X of uh, <laughs> of the town. You know what I'm talking about? Just look up the cast. Look up the cast of Percy Jackson. Whatever. I think that those movies were a absolute fever dream. And I can't believe I look back well, at we myself. Should, I was thinking we should do a whole episode of, of book to movie adaptations. Yeah, I'd be down. I think I, that we should do that. We should do video game to movie adaptations. And I can well, finally... we're already talking about some of them. We already got think... Mad Max off there. Well, Mad Max wasn't a game first, though. So I thought it was a game first. No, the oh. game was like a the game was an adaptation and a weird prequel. The only prequel that I was down with. Oh, Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan. Fuck Christ. Uh, Zeus was Sean Bean. Yeah, you don't remember Rosario that? Dawson. Yeah, Rosario Dawson was uh, fucking. Oh my gosh, they had a stacked cast, and it was still <laughs> horrible. <laughs> You said something. Maybe maybe we'll do video games. We'll oh my books. gosh, Richard Harmon as smartass kid. That's you remember his... you remember Uma Thurman as Medusa? 
Wait, where? I don't see Uma Thurman. I thought, no, no, no. She's she's there. She's there. Uma Thurman was Medusa. What are you talking about? She's not on here. Yeah, she is. I got to find this now. Uh, yep, there it is. Uma Thurman, Medusa. What? Yeah, it was a loaded cast. It's a testament that you can load up a cast with incredible actors and still make a terrible movie. But, no, we should definitely do book adaptations. That'd be great. And then we should definitely talk video game sometime I can finally watch Detective Pikachu and Sonic actually I did watch Sonic I need to watch Sonic 2 so we <laughs> and we, maybe we can get Jared talking about Sonic. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Teenage Mutant anyway um, which by the way Kate thought were actual teenagers that got turned into turtles I don't understand why sorry I just <laughs> shook the mic yes uh, apparently the, i was wrong i thought that they were teenagers that fell into toxic waste and became <laughs> turtle people i didn't know that they were turtles that fell into toxic waste and became humanoid I, that's what i'm telling you babe. it makes more sense my way but splinter was a human that got turned into a rat exactly <laughs> Uh, it's it's incredible. I think that's a that's a great episode idea. Do we have do we have anything else? What are we looking for in the Percy Jackson series? What would make it good? Is We're, I saw that the order is eight episodes. We bounce around too much. We, yeah, it's fine. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep it keep some flow going here. Eight episodes. I don't know. I'm just should glad. it just be the first book? I, either way, I'm glad that it is a TV show. Yeah, and not a movie. So I think already they're set up for success because they have more time how many books were there in the first there are a lot in the first in, in the first series though was it like five books because there was the sequel series i don't know yeah but i think yeah i'm just thinking how long these kids i'm, ass- in it. I'm assuming it's gonna be one book one season yeah that would make sense i think and i think that gives them time to breathe especially like 30 minute episodes i think it'd be good i hope it's see I understand why they cast someone older because I think they worry about making a show with a younger child be too kiddy. Yeah. But like Stranger Things had kids. I, I think Stranger Things is what broke the mold on this. Because so much before Stranger Things, even in like more even in more like film centric productions, like there were no fucking like actual kids and stuff. Well, I it's think like, they were like just the afraid to have... It's like Tobey Maguire being in high school in Spider-Man 1. Yeah. It's like, it's like kids, there's... And this goes to like the business of filmmaking. You have to take so many precautions when working with kids on set. And it totally slows down production. But then, like, there were always these like really good child actors every once in a while. But then Stranger Things came through and they made a great show with almost exclusively kids... And it was like, oh, wait, actually, like, some kids can act and they can do really well. I don't know if it was necessarily that. I mean, I'm sure that was a factor. And then, and then I think it cemented it. But I think it was, like, they were afraid of making something more serious yeah. that had kids in the center of it. Yeah. But this is something that I... I, this is why I think YA, the, mm. the book genre, gets, like, a really bad rap. Is that people forget that kids are fucking smart. Yeah. And they want serious shit. Yeah. Like, come on. Like, they don't want I think, I think My Little Pony. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that there's, that there's that interesting dichotomy between, like, like actually making stuff approachable for younger kids, but still suitable for... Like teenagers. Mm -hmm. And so much of that is like either leaning in one direction. It's either for kids or for adults. And the YA stuff grew to popularity and sort of fizzled out already at this point. YA? Not like at least in terms of like film adaptations, I mean. Because it got, it turned to a really oversaturated market where everything was turning into sort of the same mishmash by the end. So you don't see a ton of like YA like adaptations anymore. Yeah. Like the past five years. Because they make shitty movies. See, <laughs> they make shitty movies because they're cash grabbing. Yeah. Like, this is why... It gave the whole genre a bad name. Because they're... 
I understand. There's a pre-established audience, so you already are going to sell tickets. Yeah. So that's why they make movies out of books, because people get really excited about them. Like, yeah. if you if anybody hears that a book has been sold to a studio, yeah, like the excitement already starts to build. Yeah. But then they just make something shitty because they're just trying to make money. Yeah, you know, we'll have to do we'll have to do an episode on franchises getting milked for everything they're worth and talk about Fantastic Beasts. Don't make me watch them. <laughs> so I don't. I think I'm excited for for uh, Percy Jackson. I will watch it, even if the first season is mediocre. I will watch it strictly for nostalgia, and to give it a shot. I'm so curious who they cast for everyone else. I mean, yeah, if they've only cast Percy, we're far out. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see it rolling. Because they probably just haven't disclosed the casting yet. Well, no, I mean we're gonna have to wait a bit until. Yeah, probably a couple, that. probably a couple years until it's released. I'm. I just remember. It's, but they all, they're also on a clock though, because they're working really? with kids. So like, you don't want them to age too quick. This uh, kid's fair. This kid is thirteen. You I don't mean, want him to look any older. They did. They did announce the Avatar cast and then immediately started shooting. So maybe they're, they're probably getting to it. Yeah, they're probably getting to it. That's why I think they probably already have people locked down. And they just haven't disclosed it yet. I want it now. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Same. Is I want it to come out. By the way, soon. the Avatar show is in is in the throes of production, and um, uh, Mr. Kim, I always forget his name, Paul something, mm-hmm. uh, posts a picture with the kid that's playing Aang, them having dinner together. That's gonna. I'm so I'm excited. So excited. It's gonna be great. Maybe that's that'd be another talk about sequels, prequels, and all that all that jazz. That that'll be a good episode name right there. We can talk Legend of Korra versus uh, versus uh, Fantastic Beasts. <laughs> Those are <right> two very <laughs> which which expanded the mythos better. Let's just do a whole episode of us waxing poetic. No, about no, the no. Avatar universe. shows shows that I made you watch that you now love. Yeah, okay, that's we we can do that. Avatar is on there, and then I can I can add at the end shows that I forced you to finish and that ended up being pretty good. And we can put Legend of Korra on there. <laughs> there was a whole drama with Korra. We don't need to get into that. We'll leave it there. I think that I think that this podcast has gone as far as it's going to go before we start really aimlessly muttering. What's our outro? Oh, wait. I actually got to do the plug first. Otherwise, oh. uh, Jared, the Iron Fist of Old Heart Radio, will bear down upon me. For not pushing people towards the uh, Instagram. Uh, Go in, check out our Instagram. Make sure to follow. Make sure to recommend to a friend. Um, Listen to the AirPods. Uh, We just recorded a matinee edition talking about the Batman, Gotham Knights, and Moon Knight. That one was pretty fun. It's always good to record there. Uh, Under Further Reviews got some new episodes coming. I'm pretty sure they're doing a playlist focused on pissing off specific members of the council Ooh, we love drama yeah i'm i think if it's called i think i think they're calling it like anger leads to hate oh. and but and then uh whack arnold's is always doing weird shit so check that out uh we're on youtube itunes spotify everything check it out tell a friend goodbye bye see you next time <laughs>